Gracious God, we are so thankful as we gather together in this place as a community of faith. We're thankful to be able to lift our hearts up to you in worship, and we're thankful, Lord, for the way that your Holy Spirit has worked through our gathering thus far. We pray, Lord, that your Spirit would continue to work among us. And Lord, I pray that in the next few minutes that I might decrease in this place in order that Jesus Christ might increase. And I pray, Lord, that my words would be your words. And God, as always, we humbly ask that you would open our ears, open our minds, but most of all, God, open our hearts. May the words that you have for us today be more for us than simply more information, but we pray, gracious God, that we might find your words transforming, that they might transform us from the inside out. And all this we ask, gracious God, in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. It is in his name that we've offered this prayer, saying, Amen. Amen. Well, it's fascinating to me that of all the things that the disciples saw Jesus do, and if you think about all the things that the disciples saw Jesus do, they saw Jesus perform healings, they saw Jesus perform miracles, they heard Jesus teach, they watched Jesus cast out demons, they watched Jesus go around and interact with people that they themselves probably would not have interacted with people who were Gentiles, people who were Samaritans, which were hated by the Jews. All these things that Jesus did, all these fascinating things that they got to see Jesus do. And the one thing, the one thing that the disciples asked from Jesus is that Jesus would teach them to pray. Lord, teach us to pray. It fascinates me. They didn't say, Lord, teach us how to have the understanding of the scriptures that you have. Lord, help us to preach like you preach, to teach like you teach. Lord, help us to do the things that you do. But as they watched Jesus, as they paid attention to what Jesus did, the one question the disciples had, the one thing they wanted was for Jesus to teach them to pray. And this is fascinating to me. Because I think so often... In our lives, sometimes our prayers get rushed and we don't spend the time in prayer that we need to. And when we do pray, sometimes we, we're, we're like the disciples. We don't know how should we pray. What should we pray? What do we do with our time in prayer? And so in the next few weeks, Jesus is going to help us just like he helped the disciples, because we're going to go through the Lord's Prayer, and we're going to think about what these words are, these some a little little more than 50 words in the Lord's Prayer that Jesus taught the disciples to pray, and we're going to look at those. The very first part of the Lord's Prayer says, Our Father. Our Father. You know, this fascinates me because... Not so much that that Jesus would call God Father because he did indeed several times in the Gospels, many times. Jesus would say, Abba, Abba, when he was addressing God. And Abba is the Aramaic word, it's transliterated, really it means Daddy, Daddy. So it's not so unusual that Jesus would use the term Father to address God. But it does fascinate me that Jesus didn't say, when you pray, say, my Father. Or just Father. But Jesus said, pray our Father. Because it is not just about us. But it's about all of us. It's about all of us together. And it reminds us from the very beginning as we pray the Lord's Prayer that God does not just belong to you or to me, but God belongs to all of us. You know, this is not such a different idea, I think. Um, Psalm chapter 8 says this. We can have the first slide. Uh, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, 
What is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You see, this is a question that we all have, isn't it? If God is God and God is the creator of the universe, what does God want with me anyway? Why would God want to have something to do with me? Especially when we all start to consider who we really are. And the fact that we are tainted by sin and brokenness. Why would God have anything to do with us anyway? And these two first words, our Father, our Father, immediately identify the relationship that we are to have with God. Indeed, the relationship that, according to Jesus, we already have with God when we say, Our Father. Our Father. We have this relationship already. Even though we might be asking ourselves, just as the psalmist did, what in the world do you want with us anyway? The great news is that God wants us to be in relationship with God. That's what He wants. He wants more than anything else. He wants us to be in relationship with Him. Because you remember that in our creation story, way back in the book of Genesis, Adam and Eve had a relationship with God. They had a relationship with God. And, and it, it's fascinating, the relationship that Adam and Eve had with God. In Genesis 3, we read this, chapter 8, if we can have the next slide, please. We read this. The man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Isn't that a great image? Here, here Adam and Eve, they've been created by God. They're in the Garden of Eden. They have everything they need. And here is God with them. And you've got this God, image of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. That, that they already have this relationship with God. But we know that soon their sin, their disobedience breaks that relationship with God. It fragments it. And then God... Through a period of time, when God sends the prophets, when he adopts the people of Israel as his people, and finally with the coming of Jesus Christ, God keeps reaching out to us as human beings. God keeps reaching out and saying, look, I want to be in relationship with you. I want our relationship back. I want you to come back to me. And brothers and sisters, one of the things that that prayer does for us is prayer reminds us of the relationship that we are to have with God, and it cements that relationship. Those of you who are in marriage relationships, those of you who are in any relationships, know that one of the things that we preach when we do premarital counseling, when we talk to couples, we preach this all the time, is the importance of communication. The importance of communication. And communication goes beyond just saying, yes, dear, okay, whatever, right? Do you remember this commercial from several years back? I think it was a Southwest Airlines commercial where the guy's sitting at the breakfast table and he's reading his morning paper and his wife comes in and she said, honey, does this dress make me look fat? And without looking up from the paper at all, he says, you betcha. And then all of a sudden, he pulls the paper down and he looks over and his wife's got this look on her face. And of course, I think it was Southwest Airlines, you know, with their tagline, want to get away? <laughs> want to get away? But you see, communication is important in relationships. And brothers and sisters, prayer is important. It is critical in our relationship with God. And it's because God wants this relationship with us that I believe that Jesus, when he teaches the disciples and us how to pray, he says the very first thing you say is, Our Father. Our Father. And then the next line is, Who art in heaven? Father who art in heaven. You know, there's a theological argument that would bore you if I got into the details of it, but it's been happening for a long time. 
It involves these two theological words, eminence and transcendence. And the argument is about whether God is imminent, whether God is with us, or whether God is transcendent, God is beyond us. God is so different than we are, we can't get close to God. Imminence versus transcendence. It's almost as if in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus is saying, Our Father, to remind us that God is imminent. And then Jesus says to pray, Who art in heaven, to remind us that God is also not who we are. God is also other. God is not part and parcel of who we are in as much as that God is God. And we are not God. And it fascinates me because I think that this theological argument that I heard people argue about and talk about and hash out, that, that in the Lord's Prayer, it's almost as if Jesus says, when you pray, recognize that God is both imminent, our Father, and God is transcendent, who art in heaven. That God is both with us, and God loves us, and God wants to be with us. God is also the creator of the universe. Once again, I would take you back to that beautiful psalm of a few minutes ago. Who are we? When I look at the work of your hands, when I look at the heavens, when I look at the stars and the moon, who are we? Because you created those. You created those. And it reminds us that God is God, brothers and sisters. And we most certainly are not God. But we are called to be in relationship with God, which is the importance, again, of prayer. And then in the next line, it says, Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. <clears throat> Hallowed is not a word we use very much anymore. As a matter of fact, the, I was trying to think this week, the last time I, I remember hearing the word hallowed, and it was when I was in college about a block away over here, years ago at Cumberland, and I had to read a book called This Hallowed Ground, which was about the Civil War. We don't use the term hallowed very much. But Jesus teaches us to pray, Hallowed be thy name. And this is not so different from what we hear in other places in Scripture, isn't it? It, it, it harkens back. It harkens back to the, uh, the third commandment. You shall not misuse, use in vain the name of the Lord your God. And once again, it's defining the relationship, isn't it, between God and us? And one of the things that you don't want to do if you want to have relationships, if you want to have a good relationship with somebody, you don't want to misuse their name. You don't want to call them who they are not. And you want to make sure that you understand who they are and that you have respect for who they are and that you honor who they are. So that line, hallowed be thy name, reminds us that God is to be worshipped and that God is to be praised and indeed, that might be one of the reasons that we would pray, is to, is to praise God. So, as we think about our own prayer lives, as we think about the times that we spend with God in prayer, as we think about the relationship that we want to have with God, I want you to stop for a minute, I want you to think, just for a minute. What kind of relationship do you want to have with God? What kind of relationship do you want to have with God? What do you want that relationship to look like? How close would you like that relationship to be? Because you see, Jesus says, as He's teaching the disciples how to pray, we want to say our Father because He is ours. 
and we are his, it establishes the relationship. And you want that close relationship. And I think that's exactly what the disciples wanted when they saw Jesus pray, when they saw Jesus spending time with God. That's exactly why the disciples said, teach us to pray. And as we think about prayer, as we think about our own communication, as we think about our relationship with God, I would share this with you. If we have the next slide, please. This came to me without any sort of person's name attached to it. So I'm not sure if somebody said this, because, you know, we live in a time if you get something off the Internet, it's usually... Uh, it's Abraham Lincoln that said it, or, you know, Thomas Edison, or Mother Teresa. Or, I, I, but I don't know where this came from, but I love it. The best time of the day is when you pray. Why? Because you are talking to the one who loves you the most. You're talking to the one who loves you the most. And if there is a more compelling reason for us to spend time with God in prayer, it is the definition of who God is that comes in these first few lines of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The God who created you the God who made you as individual as a snowflake, as Rebecca reminds us of us, that same God wants to be in relationship with you. And the best way for us to cultivate that relationship with God, brothers and sisters, is in prayer. So how's your prayer life? Are you spending time with the one who loves you the most. I hope that as we go through the next five or six weeks, as we talk about the prayer that Jesus taught us, as we talk about these words, that if nothing else, we all will realize how much we are loved and how much the God who loved us and created us wants to be in relationship with us. Amen.